So what I want to talk about is self-assembly and programmable materials. And I want to start by looking at what computation and fabrication have done for the design industry. And number one, we could look at it on the, on the one side, um, kind of design space. They've unleashed this potential to be able to design massive amounts of complexity, geometric uh, shapes, analysis, massive iteration. So they've opened up this possibility to design things that we've never been able to design before with amazing software tools and, and computational abilities. And on the other hand, they've opened up this ability to make things that we've never been able to make before with digital fabrication, the DIY movement, maker movements, 3D printers, laser cutters, CNC routers, water jets, all of that. So we can design things, invent things, make things. Unbelievable. But what it hasn't done is change our perspective of how we assemble things. Because what happens in this DIY revolution and the mass customization is that you get many, many, many complex parts that need to be assembled in complex ways. This is a bit of a caricature, but it's me assembling a prototype for six hours straight. And it's definitely not the most fun. But it's something that we've become accustomed to with digital fabrication and this new powerful software side. And so what I'd like to do is also look at the industries at the human scale that are having the same uh, problem or let's say opportunity. Construction manufacturing, assembly, uh, distribution, all of these processes in the industrial sector um, are having the same issue that they're primarily based on brute force assembly techniques. Lots and lots of energy goes in, lots of errors, uh, many man hours, dangerous conditions, et cetera. And I think most importantly is that they're not taking advantage of what has happened in the computation and fabrication revolution. There's no computational thinking happening in the construction and manufacturing sector, except for if we think about automation. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but I think there's a huge opportunity in this industrial sector to rethink how we assemble things. And if you look at another scale, if you look at synthetic biology, chemistry, and material science, there is a revolution happening. And it's the ability to program physical, physical and biological materials to change shape, change property, compute. We've heard a little bit about that in natural computing. But what I think is super fascinating is that not only are they able to get these, these materials to make decisions or change properties, but they actually have the assembly information directly in them. So, if you're looking at uh, George Church's nanorobotics, they, they get this DNA sequence and they heat it up and cool it down, mix the test tubes together, and the nanorobot assembles itself. It has the instructions and it can open and close on demand under certain conditions. So the information and the assembly instructions are in the materials. So what, what I'd like to propose is that we go from a mindset of looking at only automation, so only smart machines, to a mindset of thinking that Materials can also have information. Materials can also engage in that assembly process. And so yes, we need smart machines. Yes, we need smart people. But we also can have smarter materials that are responding to ambient free energies around them. That's called self-assembly. It's a process by which disordered parts build an ordered structure through only local interaction. So it means no human interaction, no external influence, and the parts should be able to build highly precise structures. The vision here is that we can go from a world that looks like this, lots and lots of complex parts that come together in complex ways, complex assembly instructions, to a world that looks much more like products responding to the user's performance, user's demands, uh, products responding to how the environment changes, materials that are smarter, materials that are adapting, reconfiguring, making highly precise structures. Manufacturing techniques where the materials are the assembly instructions, the materials have the ability to error correct, come together on their own for super cheap free energy sources. Shipping where you send materials flat packed and they assemble themselves or they pop in place on site. And then the whole disassembly spectrum can radically change as well. On one hand you could say, okay, parts never fail because they repair themselves. On the other hand you could say, Yes, parts fail, but they completely uh, disassemble themselves for recyclability. Um, and you could also say, there's another one that I forget, but we'll move on. Anyway, disassembly is completely um, radically changed in this perspective because the parts have the information and they know where they are, but they can also sort themselves and separate. So what are the key ingredients for this technology? There's three main aspects here. Number one is you need the components, the materials and geometry. You need these components to be highly tuned to their material properties. 
but you also need them to start to interact in smart ways. So the second ingredient is how do these parts come together? How do they go from part a, uh, point A to point B? How do they error correct? How do they communicate locally and globally? And the third thing that's super important is energy. So the idea with energy is that if you have one material that's fixed, let's say you're using metal, that starts to constrain how those parts are going to interact and what types of energies are available. Likewise, if you constrain energy, that starts to influence the materials and the interactions. And hopefully we use some type of passive abundant energy like heat, shake, and gravity, pressure, uh, fluids, et cetera. I'm going to show a number of projects that demonstrate some of the capabilities for self-assembly. The first is a collaboration with Autodesk and Arthur Olson. We built 500 of these glass flasks. In each flask is a molecular structure. This is the poliovirus. So you shake it hard and the pieces break apart. And then you shake it a bit softer but still randomly and the parts come together to self-assemble into the final structure. And for me it demonstrates that there's um, the capability for non-random structures to be built with random energy. So super precise structures built where the user is not necessarily building them precisely. We also demonstrated self-sorting. So you dump a bunch of black and yellow parts. They can separate themselves and select into those final structures. We looked at, in, in 2012 at TED, how to build much larger scale structures, like furniture pieces. We called this the self-assembly line. It was a play on the assembly line with the vision that the user doesn't know anything about what they're building and isn't the highly skilled uh, user in the assembly line. They don't know what they're building or how to build it, but rather they're just providing energy. They're spinning this chamber, spinning it faster, spinning it slower, building an intuition for what's needed in the system. And the parts have all of the information. They have the decision making. They have the capability to build this furniture scale objects. And so they would spin it. And what I think is most fascinating is that they would get, gain this intuition, that they would understand pretty quickly how this works, what are the key ingredients. And then a dialogue could be created where a molecular biologist, a designer, and someone from a totally different industry could have a conversation about what we could do to speed it up, what we could do to stop it. And then the conversation turns to drug delivery systems. If this is based on the polio virus, what can we do to stop the polio virus from assembling? Or what are mechanisms that we can use to help it, hurt it, et cetera? So it becomes this intuitive, tangible medium to collaborate. Another project that shows more of a self-organization, instead of a final fixed state, we're looking at kind of fluid uh, transitions between states. We're looking at crystallization and material phase change we we're looking at intermolecular and intramolecular bonding schemes. So you can make uh, lattices and two-dimensional sheets. We had 350 of these neutrally buoyant spheres in a 200-gallon tank. So we, we put a neutrally buoyant sphere in there. It can move freely in all three dimensions. It doesn't sink or float. Um, and then we have these pumps in the back, and we can program the turbulence in the pumps. We can add kind of chaotic. Uh, oscillations or repetitive ones or even natural wave patterns and we can program how much energy is in the system and so these parts start to move around as they get towards the middle they get broken up as they get towards the two sides there's this sort of vortexes and they assemble on the sides and you see both local and global behaviors emerge so locally everything is uh, completely deterministic every component is the same every connection pattern is the same and locally, you'll see patterns emerge. You'll see strands, hexagons, pentagons, squares, um, these small patterns that happen over and over and over again. But globally, the behavior is much more fluid. And, it, and if you see a large clump or the whole thing uh, connected together in either a regular or irregular pattern, that is representing some type of solid, a solid object. And then if they become a bit more ambiguous or fluid, that's representing more of a fluid. Here you're seeing a pentagon show up right in the front. So you see these patterns locally and globally. If they start disconnecting all of them, that represents more of a gaseous state. So it's more of the idea that we could uh, influence the energy and we can influence the components, but the global behavior is, is more fluid. And, and then we can look at how to design not only one structure, but many, many types of structures. The last project I'm going to show is more on programmable materials. So rather than assembly with separate parts, this is how you can program materials to change shape. It's a, cl a collaboration with Stratasys. It's called 4D printing. The idea is um, you take 3D printing and smart materials and you combine them together. The reason we called it 4D is because we wanted to add time. That You don't just print things that are static, fixed, and dead. 
but rather they change over time. They adapt and transform. So we use the Connex multi-material printer. We deposit two materials at the same time. This one you're seeing here is a rigid plastic. And then in the next shot, you'll see the other one a bit more clearly. And then there's a white material that expands 150% in water. And so we deposit these at the same time. The rigid one is the structure, the angles, the information, the backbone. And the expanding one is the energy and the capability to go from point A to point B. Here you'll see a demonstration of that. Um, it's a single strand dipped in water with black and white components, and it forms into the letters MIT. And then another one that folds into the wireframe of a three-dimensional cube. And so there's no human interaction. There's no one coming in and folding it. Rather, we can design the precise structure that it starts and finishes at and how it gets there from interaction with water. We started to look at um, two-dimensional surfaces. This is a surface cube that folds again underwater. And you can see these strips, the white and black strips on all of the edge edges. And we can change the um, spacing of those and the depth of those are sort of like brushes in a way. And that allows us to design precise custom angles. So we can design any angle in, in any dimension by changing that spacing. Uh, and if you, do, if you put more material, then it goes slower but stronger, less material faster but weaker. And we can change the temperature uh, to increase the time. I'll show you one last video, which is an attempt to start to scale these processes up. This is a 50-foot strand. We rented out the Olympic swimming pool at MIT. And we dipped this 50-foot strand in the pool. And it folds over the course of an hour 75 times in linear length. So it goes into this 8-inch cube. And the idea here, although it's still very early in this research and there's still lots to do, we want to play with buoyancy and timing the different folding angles, I think it points to the idea that, um, number one, we could study these non-intuitive processes like protein folding or much more complex scenarios by tangible, large-scale things. And number two, that it's the ability for us to scale up these technologies and, and really have a, a paradigm shift in the way we make things at the industrial scale and how things come together, transform, and adapt. So I'll leave you with a quote. Can we design material parts with enough information and decision making that they can assemble themselves and adapt independently to internal and external forces? Thanks so much. <laughs>